presentation tonight is dealing with the temple in Israel, a prophetic time capsule that changed the world. Now, you'll hear a lot in the news about Israel. And, of course, the central place in Israel is what they call Jerusalem, the holy city. And on the holy city, they've got the holy mount. And there you once had the temple of Solomon. This is the very place where Abraham went to offer Isaac. It's a very significant spot in history. Three or four, you might say, major religions of the world look at this as one of, if not the holiest site. You've got Catholics and Protestants and Jews and Muslims. It's a very significant place. And this edifice that was once situated up there tells us volumes about God. But now I'm getting ahead of myself. But we're going to talk about uh, another building tonight. A building of God's engineering and designing. First, to get the history about why this is so important, we've got to go back to the book of Moses, book of Exodus principally, which is the uh, second book of Moses. When the children of Israel were led out of Egypt, they did not go immediately from Egypt to the promised land. He took them instead of north to the promised land, they went south down into the Sinai Peninsula, And there at Mount Horeb, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. This was very important. And even before they headed back up towards the Jordan River, he gave Moses some very important blueprints. They were blueprints of a temple that was going to help illustrate who God is, something about the plan of salvation, and how we approach God. It's a very important three-dimensional lesson that God gives in this building. Well, once again, I'd like to return to our question-answer format. Let's go to the first question in this presentation. Number one, why did God, I'm sorry, what did God ask Moses to build? You go to Exodus 25, verse 8, and God said, Let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Now, there are three temples in the Bible, and you'll find the word temple in the Bible mentioned hundreds of times. You've got the temple that was built. It was a portable temple in the wilderness by Moses. You've got the temple of Solomon that was built on Mount Moriah. That was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. And the third temple that was built during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, it was refurbished by King Herod the Great. Three earthly temples that were built. When Solomon dedicated his his temple, he prayed and said, Lord, this building that we're calling by your name is not for you to live in. I remember as a kid, my grandparents drove me by a synagogue and, and they said, that's God's house. And I looked and I thought, oh, God fits in there? <laughs> I, I mean, to me, I just thought, wow, that's pretty awesome that God lives in a house. I'd always thought that he was sort of bigger than that. And Solomon, in his dedication prayer, he said, you know, what house can we build for you? The earth is your footstool. So this temple was not designed to be, you know, a house where God sits and does his cooking. This was to be a place that we could approach him. See, man is separated from God by sin. And this temple was to sort of be a bridge where man was to approach God. It was to represent a a, a coming to God. There was one door in. And we'll look at the uh, geography of the temple in more detail. When the children of Israel left Egypt, just before they left, the Egyptians were so overwhelmed by the plagues that they heaped on the children of Israel all of this gold and silver and material. They said, here, we want to pay you for all your work you've done. Tell your God to bless us. They were just looking for some respite and mercy from all the the plagues that had fallen. And they gave them all this gold. Well, they put a lot of that valuable material into building this tabernacle that could be assembled and disassembled in the wilderness as they moved. God gave them the designs right down not only to the construction of the sanctuary, but to even the vestments and the clothing that the priests were to wear. Number two, what did God expect his people to learn from the sanctuary? It tells us in Psalm 77, 13, your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. God teaches us who he is and how We reach him through a building. This building actually contains the secrets in the plan of salvation. There's a lot there. Nothing God does is by accident. Now, it's important for us to understand the sanctuary because it appears through much of the Bible. From Exodus until Revelation, 
you find references to the sanctuary. Matter of fact, many of the great visions of the Bible take place in this uh, sanctuary. The one on earth is a model of God's dwelling place in heaven. For instance, uh, you go to Revelation chapter 1. It shows Jesus. He's standing among seven candlesticks. What does that represent? Well, you've got the menorah with the seven candlesticks there in the first apartment of the earthly temple. You read in Revelation chapter 11, it says the temple of God was open in heaven and I saw the ark. A lot of people are wondering where the ark of the covenant is. Well, it tells you in Revelation, the ark appears there. In Ezekiel, in Zechariah, part of the book of Daniel, you find that they're happening. Isaiah, you remember Isaiah has chapter 6. I'm assuming some of you have read some of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 6, his conversion, he sees God on his throne with two angels, one at the right and one at the left, like the Ark of the Covenant represented the dwelling place of God, two angels on that Ark. And so this was sort of a miniature of the temple of God in heaven. But that's really getting into question number three. From what source did Moses obtain the blueprints for this sanctuary, or what was the building a copy of? Did Moses sit there up on Mount Sinai and say with his pencil and his pad, I did, let's build something for God. What should I show? We make triangle like a pyramid? No, they did that in Egypt. Let's make it square. That sounds, listen, what the Bible says on that. Exodus 25, verse 40. And see that you make it, God is talking to uh, Moses and to the people, according to the pattern which was shown you on the mount. God gave Moses the plans for this tabernacle. Again, if you look in the uh, New Testament, it says in Hebrews 8, verse 5, Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he, God said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mount. So that temple is really a miniature of the dwelling place of God in heaven. And it's, it's really, uh, it's defective in that there's no earthly representation big enough to show the dwelling place of God. But um, the temple on earth is a representation of a very real dwelling place that God has in heaven. And it's there to tell us something about God and, and who he is. Now, for instance, the temple on earth, they had golden wallpaper that had angels engraved in the wallpaper. So let me ask you this question. In heaven, does God have golden wallpaper with angels engraved? Or is it real angels around his throne? Does God sit on a throne with two golden cherubim to the right and left? Are those golden ones on earth symbols of the real ones by the throne of God? You see what I'm saying? So it, it's imperfect. And even with a matchbox car, you know, it doesn't have an engine in it. You all know that. It's there, there, there's limitations. So he wanted us to know something about his dwelling place, and even more to teach about how we approach him. Number four, let's look real quickly at the sanctuary and how it was laid out. Sanctuary of Moses, they called the tabernacle, sanctuary, temple, same words. The sanctuary of Moses or tabernacle in the wilderness is going to have the same layout roughly that you're going to find in Solomon's temple. That, and Solomon's temple was one of the wonders of the world in his day and also the temple that existed in the time of Christ. So let's take a look real quick at what was that furniture in the temple. There's three principal parts of the temple. And this is real important, so I want you to stay with me. Three parts. Courtyard, then you go into the building, and in the building there's two rooms. Holy place, first room. Most holy place, sometimes called the holiest of all, is the third room. One, two, three places. In salvation... Let's see how many theologians we have there. How many phases of salvation biblically? What are the basics? There's three. Justification. Ah, oh, and I knew I'd trigger something. Sanctification and glorification. So the Bible teaches you come to God through justification. Then you follow him. You learn about being holy, living a new life. When we finally get to heaven, the third final phase, you are in glory. You got your new body, glorification. Three primary phases in salvation. The children of Israel, in their wanderings, there's three places. They were slaves in Egypt. That's where they sacrificed the lamb and they were justified. Then they crossed over into the promise, I'm sorry, the uh, wilderness, where they learned some lessons and they were sanctified. Then they crossed over into the promised land, a symbol of our promised land in heaven, 
where that's a type of glorification. So in the courtyard, there are two principal pieces of furniture. First thing is the altar. When you come through the door, it says in Exodus 29, 18, and you will burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. And again, if you look in Exodus chapter 30, the next piece of furniture, it says, you shall also make a laver of bronze and you'll put water in it. So there in the courtyard, you've got these two things. You've got the altar, you've got the later, laver. On the altar, there was a fire burning. They kept it burning all the time. They were to always keep water in the laver for cleansing. Fire, water. Two very important elements in the Bible. Children of Israel, their experience is a type of salvation. They came out of Egypt. They went through the Red Sea, water. By the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says that's kind of like baptism. And then a pillar of fire came down. So they were baptized in the water, baptized in the fire. Now when you get to the New Testament and Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless you're born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Both baptisms are important. Baptized in the water, baptized in the fire. According to the Bible, even our planet gets both baptisms. Back in the days of Noah, baptized with water. Jesus comes again and says the elements will melt, baptized with fire. Then God makes a new earth. You and I go through the same thing. Water baptism, fire baptism, new creature. And so, it's, you see what I'm saying? These symbols, very simple, but a child can understand that. We need both new beginnings. And so, does fire cleanse? Sure, you can purify with fire. Did you ever boil anything? Does water cleanse? So they represent the cleansing. They'd offer a lamb on the altar. The priest would wash them. They'd go into the next phase. All right, so I'm going to go into the next room here. This is called, what's it say up there? The holy place. I like it when you're kind of like a class, and I can hear you're out there. Inside the holy place, three pieces of furniture. There was the seven candlesticks, the light. There was a table that had 12 loaves of bread on it that were to be kept fresh before the Lord, called showbread, or some from the King James Version called it shoe bread, but it's show bread. It's bread that was presented before the Lord. And then you've got this uh, altar of incense. Those represent the three disciplines in the Christian life to keep you with the Lord. What does the bread represent? Well, we don't have to guess. Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven, and he's the word. The Bible is the bread of life. You can read in um, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4, uh, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's that manna. So if you want to survive, if you want to grow as a Christian, you need to eat. We eat the bread of life. Read your Bible. Then there was a light. Not only do you need to uh, have illumination, you need to let your light shine. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Not only is Christ the light of the world, but we reflect his light. So you are to share your faith. Don't keep it to yourself. Then that altar of incense was a little bit ethereal. They would sprinkle some uh, frankincense or some precious incense on this altar. That smoke would waft up over into the holy place, symbolizing prayer. So the three most important disciplines in the Christian life is you need to pray. Prayer is as important to a Christian as sewing clothes is to a tailor. I mean, that's our business. You need to Read the word and continue to feed on it. And you need to um, let your light shine. Share your faith. If you want to keep your faith, you've got to share it. It's like a muscle. If you don't use it, you'll lose it, right? Same thing with your brain. Brain's like a muscle in that sense. You've got to use it or you'll lose it. The next thing is in the most holy place, um, and here you see sort of a layout of the holy place and the most holy place. There was a veil that separated it. That golden ark, which is our study tomorrow night, I'll say more about that, was the only piece of furniture in the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant. And there have been a lot of stories about this, and they've had movies about this. It's sort of the missing, it is the greatest missing artifact of history because it contains stones in it written by the finger of God containing the Ten Commandments. What happened is, and the ark was in Israel up until the time of Hezekiah the king. During the time of Jeremiah, when he foretold that the Babylonians were going to conquer Jerusalem, 
While Jeremiah was prophesying, Nebuchadnezzar for about a year and a half was camped right outside the city. And God had told Jeremiah and some of the loyal priests, the temple is going to be destroyed. Temple of Solomon that had been there hundreds of years. Everything is going to be ransacked. The gold is all going to be carried off. And their national treasure was the ark. And if you want to know what happened to that, got to come tomorrow night. I'm not going to tell you right now. It's called a teaser. Deuteronomy 10 verse 4. And he wrote on the tablets, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments. Then after Moses received those stones from the Lord, he says, I turned and came down the mountain, and I put the tables in the ark that I had made. All right, so you've got a kind of a mental layout of the furniture in this temple. Number five, why did animals need to be sacrificed in the Old Testament? Why was that all necessary? I don't know about you, but when I first started reading the Bible and I got to Leviticus and it talked about all the sacrifices and I heard about all these poor innocent animals and I thought, what did they ever do wrong? Why do they have to die? It seemed a little bit brutal to me and I couldn't understand it. And, uh, you know, sin is terminal. Not only did Adam and Eve's sin affect them, it says the whole creation groans and travails. It affected the planet. It affected the animals. Everything began to suffer. And those lambs that died, or the goats or whatever the sacrifices were, represented when God would send his son, the Lamb of God, to die for the sins of the world. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness for sin. That's Hebrews 9.22. And again, in Matthew 26, verse 28, Christ, when he confirmed the covenant, the New Testament, with the disciples, he said, take this grape juice and drink it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sin. All of those lambs that had ever died through history, and by the way, the sacrificial system did not begin with Moses. You go all the way back to Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve sinned, and their lights, of, their robes of light kind of went out and they saw their nakedness and they went to sew fig leaves together to cover themselves. God said, that won't work. First of all, they didn't have enough material. It says they made aprons of fig leaves. God gave them robes or tunics of skin. Wrong material, not enough material. So where did God get skin? Way back in the beginning of the Bible. Did, did God go to... Uh, Woolworths and get some vinyl? Or did it mean something had to die? The sacrificial system was instituted way back at the gates of the Garden of Eden. And it's interesting that virtually every religion of the world had some form of a sacrificial system. Some it was chickens, some even resorted to pigs, some humans. God never prescribed that. But uh, it's interesting that they all recognize that there was this atonement that was made by sacrifice and by the shedding of blood. The Bible says the life is in the blood, and we talked about that in another night. One thing the Lord wanted to th have the people think about, children of Israel were principally shepherds. They were a nation of, of nomads and shepherds. Can you imagine how difficult it would be if, if you did something wrong? Suppose you told some lie, and, you know, it's a sin. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And you want to get right with God. You want to be forgiven. You want to have peace. And you know the only way to have peace is you now have to make a sacrifice for your sin. So you've got to either take a lamb from your flock, which is what they typically did because they were all shepherds. And this is one maybe you watched it born and you nursed it and helped it and corralled it when it was scampering off. And you bring it to the gates of the temple and you lay your hands on the head of that little victim, and you confess your sin. And then the priest takes it, or if it was the patriarchs, the father in the household, and they would cut the throat of that little victim and catch some of the blood, and it would be sprinkled before the Lord, saying, this creature has, was innocent. I've transferred symbolically my sin to this creature who has now paid with its blood so that I won't have to. That represents Jesus who paid with his blood if you accept it by faith, so that you won't have to. Now, admit it to me. Tell me. If you had to sacrifice a lamb every time you wanted forgiveness, would that make it a little more difficult to sin? You thought, oh, no, I don't want to kill another lamb. That's tough. You know, some people get callous to it. They work, 
in a slaughterhouse. I, I went to a slaughterhouse once. I don't know why our school took us there. It's supposed to educate us, but well, I'll tell you what. And yet people do that every day. And you get where well, you just don't think about it anymore because you see it so much, you get callous to it. But for me, if I had to sacrifice a lamb every time I wanted forgiveness, I'd say, you know what? I think I'm going to do without lying today because I don't, that hurts too much. What about the lamb of God? What about Jesus? If we know that it hurts him when we sin, shouldn't that make it difficult? You know, sometimes I think that love for others is the very best motive not to do something wrong. Why don't I steal from my brother? Because I love him. You know what I'm saying? Love is the reason. All right, question number six. How is the plan of salvation illustrated in the sanctuary? Well, first of all, you can read in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. All of these ceremonies and feasts that you find in the Old Testament such as the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Trumpets, they were all telling us something about when Jesus came. They were shadows. Matter of fact, the, um, the Passover was really fulfilled when Christ died on the cross because the Last Supper Jesus ate with the disciples was a Passover. In Luke, before the Last Supper, he says, I've longed to eat this Passover with you. He was the Passover lamb. We don't need to sacrifice lambs anymore. Christ is the lamb. He fulfilled all of that. Now, I don't know if you've run into this before, but uh, back in the States, uh, periodically, we run into, uh, we run into people that uh, say, well, we need to keep all the old Jewish ceremonial laws. And I think that's really strange because Jesus is the fulfillment of that. See what I'm saying? Why would someone go back to all of the shadows and types and facsimiles of Jesus when the reality of all those symbols is Christ. So anyway, I hope that made sense. So Jesus is now the Passover. We don't need to sacri sacrifice lambs for sin anymore. That's why in most Christian churches, they celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper in some fashion to commemorate his sacrifice. It says, we have a great high priest. We don't need the old priesthood. Two things tore the day that Jesus died. The garments of the high priest were torn. Some of you remember when Christ was tried, Caiaphas, the high priest, tore his robes. He didn't even know the significance of what he was doing. He was saying that the old priesthood is done away because we now have a new priesthood. Christ, our high priest, and his people and nation of priests. And the veil in the temple was torn, signifying we have a new temple now. And I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So Jesus is our high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And again, you read in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary in the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. And so is it clear right now God is saying, Jesus is our high priest. He is in the heavens in the true, what did that say up there? Tabernacle? Does God have a tabernacle in heaven? Did we just read that? Okay. So do we have a high priest in heaven? So we can go directly now to our heavenly priest for forgiveness. Christ is our high priest. Now I've got, it's, it's crude. I actually drew this, so forgive me. But it serves a purpose. I've got a little picture here on the screen that sort of outlines quickly an overview, kind of a, from looking up, looking down, on the sanctuary. First thing you'll notice is to get inside this building, how many doors are there? One door. Who is the door? Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. There's only one way to God, one way in the temple, and that's God. You notice there's a straight line in approaching God. The dwelling place of God is the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. One way in, a straight line, and there's only one way to God, and Jesus is the door. First thing you see when you come in was this altar. What happened there? Lambs were sacrificed. That represents the sacrifice of Christ. The starting place in the plan of salvation is accepting Christ as your sacrifice. Children of Israel could not begin their journey towards the Red Sea or towards the Promised Land until they sacrificed the Passover lamb. And you'll see there on my illustration, I've even got a little cross there because... I had one rabbi tell me this, it's not in the Bible, that not only was there an altar in the courtyard, but they had a stake driven in the ground 
They didn't kill the lambs and catch the blood when it was on the altar. They did that by the stake driven in the ground there in the courtyard. And so this is a symbol of the cross. And so then you go, the next thing is you go to the laver. And after the laver, that's a symbol of uh, baptism. First you get the sacrifice, and after you accept the Lord, the next thing you move towards is this commitment, this new life, this washing. Then you go through the other door. Once you, baptism is sort of entrance to the church, it's entrance into the wilderness, this new relationship with the Lord, where now you've gone from the outside, the courtyard, to the inside. You're part of the household of God. There you've got those three things we talked about, the bread, the candlestick, the altar of incense that represents prayer, Final way in was the Ark of the Covenant into the most holy place or the holiest of holies. So I just wanted you to have this in your mind so you can kind of find your way around there mentally because it will make sense as we proceed. And this was such a holy structure. The Bible says in Solomon's day when they were building the temple and it was an exquisite building, massive stones of marble and gold, more gold in one building than any other building that's ever been built. Uh, David had spent his life accumulating the gold that went into this building of Solomon's. It says back then in Solomon's day, there was so much gold in Jerusalem, silver was not even valued as anything. It was like stones. Can you imagine that? The splendor of Solomon's time has been unsurpassed. The temple, when it was being built, was built with stone, finished at the quarry, so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. It was so sacred that all they heard was the, the low grind of these stones being moved uh, reverently into position. Well, that temple of Solomon was destroyed in 586 by King Nebuchadnezzar. And that same time, the children of Israel were carried off to Babylon. And many of them thought, God's covenant to his people is over now. We failed him. And the, what will ever happen to God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? While in Babylon, Daniel had been praying. Because Jeremiah foretold they'd only be in Babylon 70 years, and he would restore them. That God had not forgotten the Jewish people. You know, if there's no other evidence for the validity of the Bible, friends... It's the Jewish people. There is no other people in the world that have beat the odds like that where they have been conquered and scattered numerous times and maintained their identity, their language, their writing, their religion, and somehow got their territory back again. No other nation. Every other nation, when they're conquered, they intermarry, they disappear. They're absorbed by history. They dissipate. But the Jews are an enigma. And uh, the Bible, by the way, is a Jewish book, with the exception of Gospel of Luke, part of the book of Daniel. It's all written by Jews. All right, so Daniel's praying. He's saying, Lord, have you given up on your people? How long until we come back? Uh, is the covenant still in place? And while he's praying that prayer, God sends an angel by the name of Gabriel to speak to him. He gives one of the most important prophecies in the Bible, and it starts with Daniel 9, verse 23. The Ga Gabriel, the angel, says, At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I have come to tell you. Seventy weeks are determined for you. So Daniel's praying. An angel comes to explain how much time until the Messiah comes. This prophecy tells about the time of Jesus' first coming. I want you to know that Jesus came on time the first time, because I also want you to know he's going to come on time the second time. This is very important, friends. Seventy weeks, the angel goes on, are determined for your people, that's the Jews, and for the holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision, and to anoint the most holy. Those uh, last four words, I want you to notice them. Anoint the most holy. There's, so 70 weeks are going to go by, and I'll tell you what that represents in just a moment. And before that 70 weeks are up, the most holy is going to be anointed. By the way, what does the word Christ mean? Christos is Greek for anointed. I used to think his first name was Jesus and his last name was Christ. It's really a title. Jesus the Christ or the anointed. Jesus the Messiah is the Jewish word for saying anointed. Okay? And so that's Daniel 9, 23 and 24. Number 7. What event and date 
were to mark the starting point for this 490 year prophecy. I got to explain something before I get to that part. It said 70 weeks are determined for your people. In the Bible, a day represents a year. And so 70 weeks, how many days in a week? Now you're going to have to, if you see anyone near you, relax and nudge them, wake them up. Okay, I want everyone to hear this. Okay, because you do a little math here, and I know you've trained yourself from school to go to sleep during math class. But I want you to wake up. This is very important. How many days in a week? Am I not going too fast, am I? Okay, 70 weeks, how many days? Seven times seven, 49, 70 times seven, 490. If a day equals a year in prophecy, and we'll give you scriptures on that in just a moment, 490 days is really 490 years. So it's telling us there's going to be 490 years until the anointing of the Messiah. This is called the 490 year or 70 week prophecy of Daniel 9. One of the most incredible Bible prophecies. Very precise. All right, Daniel 9.25, he goes on to say, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. So their first phase of this is dealing with Jerusalem. They're sent back to Jerusalem. They get to restore and build the city. Until the Messiah, the Prince, there'll be seven weeks. First there's seven times seven. Forty-nine weeks is forty-nine years that they took building, uh, not 49 weeks, other 49 years, seven weeks, rebuilding the walls and the temple during a time of great persecution. So it first blocks that off. Then it says there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So you've got 69 total. One week's being left off to 70. You get that? 62 and 7 is how many? 68, 69 weeks. One week's missing. Because at the beginning of that last week, something very significant happens in history. Now, real quick for reference here, it says, um, oh wait, I want to back up here. It says, until the Messiah, the Prince, all right, I have appointed you each day for a year, Ezekiel 4, 6, in prophecy, a day is a year. And again, Numbers 14, 34, for every day that these 12 spies wandered the promised land, they were given a year to wander in the wilderness. And there's even a, a New Testament example. Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke 13, 32, when someone said, you better be careful, King Herod has executed John, he's probably gunning for you next, Jesus responded with a prophecy. Listen, he said, go tell that fox, King Herod, behold, I cast out devils and I perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I'll be perfected. Well, Jesus makes this prediction about six months into his ministry. He did not preach three more days. He preached three more years. Christ referred to those three years as days. So there's a lot of evidence for a day equaling a year in Bible prophecy. The starting point is the command to restore and build Jerusalem. You can actually find a copy of this in your Bible in Ezra 7.7. 7. It's the decree of King Artaxerxes that's given in very well-established date in history, 457 B.C. And so that means if you go 70 weeks or 490 years from 457 B.C., that comes to 34 A.D. But Jesus died in 31 A.D., and he was baptized in 27. What happened there? Well, let's, let's find out more about this. Number eight, was the Messiah anointed 69 prophetic weeks or 483 literal years after 457 B.C., as the angel said? Wow, friends, this is phenomenal prophecy to me. It, you can read here in um, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, yes, Jesus was baptized in 27 A.D., exactly 483 years. That's the 490-year um, prophecy minus seven years. 483 years after the decree. You find that verse in Acts 10, verse 37. It says, The word that you know after the baptism, John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Some of you know, I'm assuming Christ was baptized. Was he baptized as a baby or was he baptized at 30? At 30. He was dedicated as a baby in the temple by Joseph and Mary, but he wasn't baptized until he was 30. Matter of fact, it says in Luke 
right around his birthday as he began to be 30 years of age. Why did Jesus wait till he was 30? Well, according to the Jewish law, you could not serve as a priest until you were at least 30. It's also interesting that Joseph was exactly 30 when he began to reign. David was exactly 30 years old when he began to reign as king. 30 is sort of a, a pivotal mark there in the Bible. And your car insurance goes down once you turn 30 too. But I don't know if that has any biblical significance. <laughs> Number nine. Oh, and at Christ's baptism, he came up out of the water. The heavens opened. The Holy Spirit came down and anointed him. He was filled with the Holy Spirit in a special way. Did Jesus begin his ministry before or after his baptism? It says after his baptism, he then began preaching, saying, he may have gone to temple when he was 12 years old and talked to the teachers then, but he didn't begin any public ministry. There's no miracles recorded by Jesus until after he began his ministry at his baptism. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit, 27 AD, exactly 483 years after King Artaxerxes' decree, just as Daniel the prophet had foretold. That to me just gives me little goosebumps. God's word is very dependable. Number nine, what was to happen in the final week of the 70 weeks of prophecy? You can read about this. Back to Daniel 9, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So you remember there was first, I just got to do this with my hands. I'll show you a chart in a minute. First, there was seven weeks was building the wall in the city. 62 more weeks, total of 483 years or 69 weeks. After that, Messiah is cut off. What does cut off mean? He is cut off from the land of the living. And not for himself. Well, if not for himself, for who? For Doug Batchelor. And for you. He was cut off for those who will accept him and believe in him. And he wants that to be you. And it says, he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will bring to an end the sacrifice and offering. All right, friends, you've got to get this straight. Now, this is a very important and controversial verse in the Bible. There are a lot of Christians, dear Christians, and I'm not here to criticize them. You've got to get this right. Where it says, he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. A lot of Christians think that he there is talking about the Antichrist. Traditionally, the great reformers believed this is talking about the Messiah. I'm in that group. I believe this is the Messiah. And one reason people get confused is because you've got to think like a Jew. Let me explain something. In Jewish literature... They often, like a newspaper, they'll give the headlines and then they back up and give the details. Genesis is that way. Starts out, it talks about how God creates the world in six days. Then it backs up and says, now here's how God made Adam's wife and here's how God, uh, Adam named the animals. We think, what did, did, it says that the world was made in, in six days and it talks about the seventh day and then it goes back and tells how woman was made. Is this another woman? Did the first one go bad? What happened? And it confuses people because it's not given sequentially. Most of the Jewish writings are not given sequentially. The prophecies are not given sequentially. The way the Jews write is they'll give the perspective here, then they'll walk over and say, I'm looking at the same thing, but now I'm giving the perspective here. And then they'll walk over here and say, now this is the perspective here. You should have seen my family when they'd all get in a room and talk. They all talk at the same time, and everyone knows what everyone else is saying. <laughs> all talking and listening at the same time. And it's, it's, it's very confusing. But... So he tells about the, the subject of the whole vision is, when will the Messiah come? And it tells that the, the people of the prince that will come will destroy the city. Speaking of the Romans are ultimately going to destroy the city and the temple. But then he backs up and says, but he, the Messiah, will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Another reason this has to be Jesus. Does the Antichrist make a covenant with God's people anywhere or with anybody? Show me one covenant made by the devil with people in the Bible. There is no covenant. The whole context of Daniel 9 is talking about God has not forgotten his covenant with his people and he will confirm that covenant for a week, that last seven years. But in the middle of that last seven years, three and a half is half a seven, the Messiah will be cut off 
That's exactly what happened. Now, here's a chart that helps illustrate what we're talking about. You see that on the screen? All right, first you see I've got the part highlighted here. Here's where the decree begins. It talks about 457 B.C. That's where the decree of Artaxerxes goes forth. Then you got 483 years until the Messiah would begin his ministry. Jesus is baptized in 27 A.D. This is exactly what was supposed to happen then. He's anointed. He now confirms the covenant with God's people. He does it for a whole year. Three and a half years he does it in person. Then he dies and he tells the disciples, I, you go in my name. As the Father sent me, so send I you. You are to be my reflection. I'm going to continue to confirm the covenant with God's people for another three and a half years before we go to the Gentiles. You got that? In the middle of that last seven years, he causes the sacrifice to cease. When Jesus died on the cross and that veil was rent in the temple, it stopped the sacrificial system that year. They were getting ready to sacrifice a lamb. There was an earthquake. You remember reading this in the Bible? Matter of fact, it wasn't long after that the whole temple was destroyed in 70 AD and, and the Jews have not sacrificed lambs from that day to this because they don't have a holy place. And you'll hear all kinds of rumors about them rebuilding the temple. Have you heard that before? I've been there several times and I don't anticipate you're going to see that. Some of you might have questions about, doesn't the Bible say the temple has to be rebuilt before Jesus comes? Write that down and turn it in tonight with your questions. And uh, Brother Gary and I will deal with that tomorrow. All right, and then you've got in the middle of that last year, Christ dies on the cross, 31 AD, exactly three and a half years later. And you can read about this in 2 Corinthians 3.14. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. When Jesus died, the veil separating man from God was taken away. Christ was God veiled in humanity. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've come to reveal the Father. Number 10. Jesus instructed his disciples to begin preaching to what group? You can read here in Matthew chapter 10 verse 5. It says, go not in the way of the Gentiles but go rather to the law sheep of the house of Israel. He was to begin preaching to the Jews. Do you ever see Jesus going to, you know, the Greeks in Rome, or, the, or not the Greeks in Rome, those are the Latins in Rome, the Greeks in Greece, or, or uh, the Egyptians? He, his whole ministry stayed among the Jews. Matter of fact, one time this um, Canaanite woman came to him up by Tyre, and she said, Lord, please heal my daughter. And Jesus said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He did heal her daughter. He had mercy on her. He made an exception. But he said, my ministry is not to the Gentiles. I have come to confirm the covenant with God's people. The covenant God made with Abraham is that through the descendants of Abraham, the whole world would be blessed. Jesus was the fulfillment of that. He was the seed of Abraham. And he confirmed the covenant of salvation with the Jews. The Jews had the first opportunity. Remember, Christ told them, if you don't accept, though, it's going beyond you. Matthew 21, verse 43, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits of it. That's why Paul, and when he started going out and preaching to the Jews in the synagogue, when they didn't listen, and again, I hope I'm not sounding anti-Semitic, I'm Jewish. But when Paul went preaching, they plugged their ears, they didn't want to hear it. He said, look, seeing that you prove yourselves unworthy of these things, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Then the gospel went to the Gentiles and there was an explosion of Christianity. Do you know that Buddhism began in India, but there are more Chinese Buddhists than Indian Buddhists, right? You'll find more Buddhists in Japan than you can find in India. Well, I don't know. I better not say that. That may not be true. I just know there's a lot of Buddhists in Japan. I've been there. And so there are a lot more believers in Jesus among the Christians than among the Jews. It went beyond them. So the emphasis was not the building anymore. The purpose for that building really imploded. It's never been rebuilt, and it's, I don't believe it will be. And I know that sounds uh, maybe unpopular, but I believe it's biblical. You know what Jesus said? When he began his ministry, he chased all the money changers out of the temple, and he said, this is my father's house. John 2, verse 16. He said, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. He called the temple my father's house. But at the end of his ministry, when they rejected his teaching, he walked out of the temple, and what did he say? Your house is left unto you desolate. 
while he was still among them and he was still teaching. He taught in the temple daily. But when they finally rejected him as Messiah, he walked out and said, your house is left to you desolate. And when that veil ripped, when he died on the cross, the purpose for the Jewish temple was complete. We don't need to sacrifice lambs anymore. Jesus is the lamb. It's a different kind of temple. You remember where Christ said, uh, here we got Matthew 24 verse 1. His disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And he said, do you not see all these things? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. This is not the important temple. Christ said in John chapter 2 verse 19, he said, destroy this temple that is made with hands. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What temple was he talking about? The Bible says he spoke of his body. What is the church called? The body of Christ. And again, Mark 14, when they tried to get witnesses to agree and accuse him, the only two characters they could get to somewhat agree said this, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands and within three days I'll build another one made without hands. Well, he did say something very close to that. He, the, the purpose for that physical temple was gone. Now there still are two temples. God's got a temple on earth called his church. And the church is not a building. The church is people. The Bible says we are living stones built up into a holy habitation for God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit as well. All of us collectively make the temple of God in the body of Christ. Number 11. Since Jesus died in the middle of this final week in Daniel chapter 9 that we're talking about, how did he continue to confirm the covenant for the last three and a half years? You read on here in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. It says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was, was what? Was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Christ in person for three and a half years, he preached. He died in the middle of that last week of Daniel's prophecy. Then for three and a half more years, the disciples preached until AD 34. And what happened then? Stephen was stoned. The Supreme Court of the Jewish nation plugged their ears. We'll get to this here in a moment. Jesus said to the disciples, as the Father sent me, so I've sent you. So the disciples confirmed the covenant. Do you realize that when Peter and the disciples were preaching for that first three and a half years after Jesus, they didn't go to the Gentiles. How many of you have heard of Pentecost where 3,000 were baptized in one day? What religion were those people who were baptized? It says, there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout Jews. It was 3,000 Jews. It's not until Acts chapter 10 that God basically hits Peter over the head with a vision and says, now you can go to the Gentiles. It wasn't until after the stoning of Stephen, the disciples went everywhere preaching the gospel. That was 34 AD and it's in your Bible. So when did this 70 week prophecy or 490 year prophecy conclude? 34 AD Stephen is stone. Now why is this such a significant event? You read in your Bible in Acts chapter 7. It tells you that this spirit filled deacon just like Jesus is falsely tried before the same group that had condemned Christ. His face shines and he says I see Jesus sitting on the right hand. The Supreme Court of the Jewish nation, the Sanhedrin, said, we don't want to hear any more about Jesus. You know what they did? They shouted to drown him out and they plugged their ears. What would you do if you went to court to plead your innocence and the judges plugged their ears? Is that a good sign? What does it mean when the religious leaders of a nation plug their ears? The nation of Israel officially was rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. That doesn't mean Jews can't be saved. If that's true, I'm in trouble. Everyone can be saved. But their work as a nation was to proclaim and introduce the Messiah to the world. They did it. They did it during Pentecost. They did it for three and a half years. Then Gentiles began to pour in. Then Jews and Gentiles took the gospel everywhere. But the purpose for the nation of Israel back then was to introduce the Messiah. Now don't misunderstand. I still think God's got something extraordinary planned for the Jewish nation. I think you're going to see a great revival among the Jews. And the gospel is going to go everywhere. But uh, their purpose as a nation back then to introduce the Messiah, do you think Jesus, his uh, first coming, they've done that. I think there's going to be a revival among Jews to help prepare the world for his second coming. 
spiritual Jews and literal Jews. So in 34 AD, Stephen is stoned. And now the gospel goes everywhere. Who is holding the clothes for the people that are stoning Stephen? Someone by the name of Saul, whose name was later changed to Paul, the famous apostle that went to the Gentiles. That wrote a good part of the New Testament. He was there as the primary uh, witness in the execution of Stephen. This is a very pivotal time there in the Bible. Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8. It's where God is fulfilling his role of that 490 year prophecy. So yeah, let's review it one more time. 70 weeks are determined for your people, Daniel. To anoint the most holy. To bring in everlasting righteousness. And so God did bring the children of Israel back from Babylon into the promised land. They built the street and the wall again during 49 years of troublous time. The temples rebuilt. Then there's another, there's a 483 year period until the Messiah is anointed. 27 AD, Jesus is anointed. He begins his ministry. Jesus preaches three and a half years exclusively to Jews and then he is crucified. The veil in the temple rents. But he still has patience with his people. He gives them another three and a half years to listen through the disciples. Then the Jewish nation officially rejects that message. The disciples scatter everywhere. They're persecuted. They preach throughout the Roman Empire and the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Big question now, who are God's people today and where is his temple? Well, the Bible says, Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, if you've accepted Jesus, you are a spiritual Jew. You remember what John the Baptist said when he was preaching? He said to the religious leaders that came, Do not think to say within yourself that we're going to be saved because we're Abraham's seed. God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Paul said he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Uh, he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Matter of fact, I'm jumping ahead. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. That is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of Abraham. What makes you a true child of Abraham? Abraham was known for his faith. If you have faith in God, if you have faith in Christ, then you become a child of Abraham. You know that whole parable of the rich man and Lazarus? Here you got Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom and the rich man is not. Christ was telling the Jewish nation, you might be feasting on the word of God, but the Gentiles who are the beggars at the gate, they're going to be in Abraham's bosom and you'll be in outer darkness because you don't believe Moses and the prophets. God doesn't save people based on their DNA. He's not a racist. He saves people based on their faith. Christ says, whosoever will. Let him come and take the water of life freely. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that means everybody has this opportunity. You become children of Abraham. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed of Abraham. Again, he's not a Jew that is one outwardly, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Now, if you're anti-Semitic, you're going to have problems because... Uh, you cannot be a Christian and not be at least a spiritual Jew. By the way, I could never understand how people who claim to be Christians could really hate Jewish people while they're reading a Jewish book. A book's all read by, written by Jews. Right? It doesn't make any sense at all. So, shalom. <laughs> First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house. So where is God's temple now? We are living stones. Christ is the cornerstone, the Bible says. You are the temple of God. I am the temple of God. And Christ dwells in us individually. Your body is his temple. And he dwells in us collectively as his people when we accept Jesus. We become a holy priesthood to offer up what kind of sacrifices? Do we kill lambs anymore? spiritual sacrifices sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving and our love and our service these are what is acceptable to God that old Jewish temple was destroyed in 70 AD it's never been rebuilt right now in that place where the temple was you've got the most volatile piece of geography on the planet and I'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow some are wondering oh, aren't there plans to destroy the Dome of the Rock the Mosque of Omar there on Temple Mountain to rebuild the temple I can tell you about that right now. 
Number, no, it's not another number, it's a closing verse. Hebrews 9, verse 23. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly, the heavenly sanctuary is purified with better sacrifices than these. What is the sacrifice that's being offered in heaven now? Is someone up there killing lambs and goats and oxen and doves? Or what's being offered in your behalf and my behalf? What blood is being presented right now for forgiveness? Christ is spreading out his nail-scarred hands before the Father. He is our high priest. He is our lamb. He is the door. He is the way. He's the living water that you'd find in that altar. He's the bread of life that you find on the table of shoe bread. Jesus is the light in the sanctuary that lights the world. The whole thing is telling us about Christ. He's the lamb. He's everything. He's our priest. All of it is pointing to Jesus. And this whole sanctuary is telling us, how do we get back to God? We've been separated. And it's all shouting at us through Jesus. The only way to get back to Christ, or to God, is through Christ. And as we close our session this evening, I'd like to just have prayer with you once again. If you'd like to say with me, Lord, by your grace, I want to be a spiritual child of Abraham. I want to have your spirit. I want to be prepared for your return. Hey, one more thought. I know we're out of time. Did you notice something? Jesus came just as the prophecy said the first time, right on time. Do you think you can believe the Bible that he says, I will come again? He's going to come. Very soon, friends, and that's why you're here. The Lord has brought you. I pray that you'll keep coming. Let's stand together as we close with prayer. Loving Lord, as we're gathered in this place, we are gathered in your presence. And our hearts are stirred as we consider how awesome it is that you see all of time in a glance and you have outlined the whole history of the world in the prophecies. That your son came right on time the first time. He began his ministry and ended his ministry right on schedule. And we believe that he's coming again just as you promised also on schedule. Lord, sometimes the world thinks that it's been delayed, but you've even foretold that. I pray that everybody who's listening right now, those who may be gathered here, those who may be watching the broadcast, will recognize you are speaking to their hearts, and you want them to be, to be ready for this momentous event when your son comes. Bless each person. Bring us again, Lord, and I pray you'll fill us with your spirit. Help us to accept the sacrifice that you've made in our behalf that Jesus is ever interceding for us as our high priest. And may we find peace and grace because of that truth. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.